Welcome to another special episode of Better Business, Better Life, where myself, Nick and Jenny Clift are talking about what the heck is EOS and some of the questions, common questions that are actually asked about EOS by our clients or people who are considering adopting EOS into their practice. We actually recorded this uh, as, as a whole podcast episode and we've broken it down to two pieces to make it easy to digest. So if you're keen to listen to part one, then please go back to last week and have a look for part one. And this is part two, continuing on that journey. So I'm going to ask some questions around when I'm talking to potential clients. So one of the things that I get sometimes is, okay, so we're really keen on on signing up and, and doing this EOS thing, but we're going to wait until X happens. So have you ever had that, you know, and whether that's, oh, you know, we've got a bunch of projects on, so we just want to get these done or whatever it may be. But have you had that question and how, uh, what's your response been? Nick? Yeah, um, I, I haven't. To be honest, I haven't really had a lot of that challenge because the the way I've been approaching it when a when a client is asks a little bit of a question about EOS, I'm pretty good at explaining the benefits that have happened to us, and and it's like you don't need to have things. You don't like you don't go and cut your hair and go to the makeup artist before. You employ someone to do your hair and makeup for a wedding, for example, or you don't go and mow your lawn before you get the lawnmower guy to come in. And I just have a whole bunch of analogies like that. And I say, well, why do you think you need to complete all these projects and recruit an extra person on the leadership team? And, oh, we've got a problem with Bill over in accounts. We need to fix him up before we can start this process. I said, well, that's one way of doing it, but we could start the whole process together. And I can guarantee you we will touch on all of those things and we'll solve all those issues on the journey through and you'll bring everyone on the same page on the same journey and you end up with a hugely better result. So uh, I I, I probably don't let people use that as an excuse, to be honest with you. (laughs) And I I love your analogies, actually. That's really cool talking about, you know, not mowing the the grass before or or cleaning your house before the house cleaner comes, right? Someone I can certainly relate to. Yeah. And to answer your question, Jenny, I think that I always ask the question, so what's going to happen when that when that thing happens? Like, what's going to be different? Um, and, you know, sometimes I get a bit cheeky and I go, so how's it working for you at the moment? You know, <laughs> because if we keep doing the same thing over and over again, we're going to get the same results. So why don't we try something a little bit different? Because I know that the, the tools and the framework we have will actually give you a real opportunity, as Nick said, to kind of pull all these minds together and actually help solve these issues potentially quicker than you would do if you're trying to do it on your own. So, yeah, what's holding you back? Um, yeah. What? what the difference if you if you did solve that first <laughs> all the answers are generally in the room already like most yeah. businesses have very smart people in the business and sometimes they just don't have a, mm-hmm. a an environment or a platform to express themselves and and have their and in a safe supportive way and once you create that environment with your leadership team or any team in the business through that through the process mm-hmm. of saying we're here to deal about a business issue nothing personal everybody's voice is equal. There's no hierarchy in these meetings. Once you're in the meeting, you're all treated equals. And I start all my sessions with saying, it's a, it's actually a privilege to be here. The owners of this business have entrusted the future of the company to you guys in this room. So it's a privilege to be here. Don't don't waste the time here and your input is required and, and, and is valued. So just don't hold back and nothing you say will be ever held against you in the room. Um, and there's some interesting things come out of that. And, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, and that's as us as implementers are allowed are able to go to places where potentially a line manager couldn't go because they've got the history mm-hmm. with the person or they've got to sit next to them tomorrow. Whereas I don't, I'm only there once a quarter, and I can be the bad guy. That's no problem. Always with the best yeah. intentions for the company, obviously. And, and caring for the people. I, I call it poking the bear, yeah. but I, I do sort of pre- preface that by saying, you know, I love poking the bear, but I actually do it from a place Absolutely. of love. I do it from a place where I actually want to make sure that this, the poor old bear is not doing itself any disservice. And I think you've touched on a really interesting point there. So, you know, when you're in the, the any team meeting, the leadership team or the sales team meeting, you are all absolutely equal. Mm-hmm. And sometimes the answers to these things come from the most unusual places. So, you know, I remember working with a client where they had a real major cash flow issue. And normally you kind of go, well, that's for the finance person to deal with or whatever. And in actual fact, it was the chef in the business who kind of came up with a solution. Wow. Because once we'd really identified what the real issue was, um, we went around and discussed it. And this person who generally kind of cooks food sort of went, well, how about we try this? It was like, oh, okay, genius. So, you know, it's not, it's nice to have the power of other people um, helping you solve your problems. 
Definitely. Absolutely. And somebody who's not in the weeds, who's got that mm. sort of, you know, but potentially still in the business, but a, a bit of a, you know, sort of, um, you know, a step back from what's going on can come up with some great ideas. Mm. Yeah. So what do you say, Jenny, when you get asked that? Oh, probably something along the lines of I do like Nick's analogies around, you know, um, or as you said, Deborah, you know, you don't clean the house before the, the housekeeper or house cleaner comes. Yep. Um, but I think it more around um, so how long have you had, you know, X in the business? Oh, you know, 20 years. Well, you know, are you going to wait another 20 years? Um, you know, yep. so that's how I handle it. But it is one that I do get sometimes of, oh, you know, we just need to get through this phase. Hmm, okay. And the, the one business in particular that I had this conversation with, same industry as Nick and I have been in and, um, you know, 25 years that had the same uh, issue going on for 25 years to so, say, well, you know, I'm hoping to not still be working in another 25 years, but, uh, you know, perhaps we don't need to wait quite that long. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Perfect. <laughs> and the other question I, um, I don't know if I've actually had this question, but it's certainly a, um, you know, a, a topic that, that I hear um, in our community as, as implementers is when people say, you know, why would I pay for an implementer? I can buy the book, I can self-implement, but why would I go and pay for somebody to do this? Uh, so if you have had that question or if you did get that question, what would your response be? Mm. Yeah, well, I've, um, I have had that, that that question, and my answer is always the same. It's like, you know, it's like people that drive um, fancy cars. I mean, I call it fancy cars, but you know, I call it a practical car, like an Audi or, a, you know, versus a Hyundai or a um, Daihatsu or something. And getting from A to B is a journey. You can choose to take a, an uncomfortable, difficult journey with lots of stops, or you can get in a business class flight and go there quickly. And that's that's what I think the whole EOS methodology is. It's not there's nothing magic about it. There's nothing that you couldn't do yourself. There's nothing. There's no magical tool that hasn't been taught in other business schools over the years. But it's the combination and this rigor of doing it regularly and having that accountability is the number one thing. And you know, from my own experience, holding yourself and your life partner, business partner, coworker, manager children in your business accountable is very difficult um, to hold them accountable. Whereas an external implementer can be that accountability partner. You know, we're not there every day of the week, but definitely once a quarter we're there and we're, we're absolutely shining the spotlight on every single part of it. So there's um, that, that's kind of the major advantage I see of an implementer. Plus, plus the experience that we bring, you know, like Deborah's got years of running other businesses. We've run our own businesses for 30 years. Um, it depends what you're looking for, and that's probably how you go through the process of choosing an implementer. Um, you know, we all deliver the OS methodology and tools and the education the same way, but it's our unique experiences that and, and how you relate to people that can add super value to your team, that's for sure. And personalities as well. I mean, you've got to actually, I think the relationship with an employer is a really important one. Um, they've got to feel comfortable uh, working with you and vice versa. But I use, I, I use analogy myself on this one. I always say it's like, um, it's like having a personal trainer versus just signing up to a gym. Yeah. So, you know, you can sign up to a gym and you can go along and sometimes you might do the exercises. Sometimes you kind of go, oh, I'm feeling a little bit lazy today. I won't bother. Or you can have a personal trainer who's actually there alongside you. And with my personal trainer, she's not only there alongside me and pushing me when I don't want to do it, even when I've had a couple of glasses of wine the night before but she's also then got an app as well and she's actually keeping track of things for me and making me track my food intake and my exercise and everything else and so it's kind of like putting it on steroids is actually you're, you're still going to get to the end goal but you're going to get there a whole lot quicker because you because I need someone to actually hold me accountable but also more importantly she doesn't get tied up in all the stuff if you're doing it within your own business and you absolutely can and you know, there's nothing wrong with that but you have relationships in there with people um, that can sometimes just make it a little bit hard to call out the elephant in the room or to poke the bear or to you know so it's like actually having somebody external they've got a little bit more permission to do a little bit be a little more cheeky about um, asking the questions and we and I always say we don't tell people what to do we never do with the dumb person at the front with the marker but we are external and therefore we can ask the right questions and like Nick said based on your experiences we've I've worked with about 500 companies over my coaching career and you know 10 or 20 in my actual business career and so I I I don't have the answers, but I know the right questions to ask, uh, which will help you come up with the answers. Yeah, and there's definitely a theory that you can't work 
on a system if you're part of that system. So like facilitating a, a full day strategy session, if you are a senior executive in that business and you're the facilitator of the day, it means you're not participating in the thinking part mm. and contributing to the actual strategy. So that, that to me is, a, is the probably the number one thing. And the feedback I get from the clients I work with that just, just the external facilitation on the day, aside from all the tools, like that, that stuff is gold, but the whole, you know, as, as we support our clients on the way through the whole journey, I think it, it really does add up. And yeah, I, you know, like ta- even for me, I can't even take notes in a meeting. If I'm taking notes, I'm tuned out. I'm not contributing to that meeting at all. Yeah. Well, that's just me. Some people, we have a, one of Jenny and my uh, fellow EO Melbourne members is, a, is an absolute machine. He, he can generate like oh. 30 pages of notes from a one hour meeting and still contribute and listen. Mm-hmm. So I don't know how the hell he does it, but he just like he's like one of those unicorns. But that's not me. <laughs> he's one. He's one in a million. He's absolutely one in a million. I'm, definitely, I'm very. I'm very digital. It's either going in or it's coming out. I can't do both at the same time. <laughs> And we won't mention anything about that male, you know, general generalization of, uh, you know, you can't walk and talk, will we, Nick? No, because <laughs> our, our note, our note taking friend that. absolutely can do both at the same time. Uh, and yeah, I think, and yeah, a couple of other things. So, Nick, one thing you mentioned there was a good segue for my next question, which is as an implementer, what's your best or favorite comment or feedback that you've had from a client? Oh, yeah, I love this one. So, this was a, um, uh, a client that I met through association and we had a meeting and we decided to progress together and they'd been working with us, uh, a, another external strategy coach for five years. So I was, um, I was very confident of that uh, EOS was the right thing for them and where they were in their journey. Um, but it was a little bit of, um, I don't know, um, yeah, bit of nervousness about, hey, I'm, I'm the new guy coming in to, to take this leadership team on a journey when they've had another guy. And he happened to be in the, the session as well, so the, the previous strategy guy. So I was kind of thinking, and the, anyway, get to the cut to the chase. At the end of the day, the CEO kind of thing said, mate, that was amazing. I did not see that discussion. And this was about the accountability chart and, and the, the, posi- the, the key roles in the business. He said, I did not see that going in that direction. And different people were in different roles to where they were at the, in the morning session that started the day. And he said, but that was amazing. And everyone was crystal clear on it, knew exactly what they needed to do for the next period. And go, yep. So that's what it's all about. And just that crystallization of, yeah, at lunchtime, it was complete confusion. There was upset people. There were grumpy people. There were people not like, hang on, my job is on the line and this kind of stuff. And then after lunch, they came back and it all crystallized again. Man, this makes so much sense, and everyone was happy. So that that's probably the best feedback I've ever had after a session. And I really appreciate it. And that, uh, yeah. yeah, and they're they're rolling with it. And you know, they've had a couple of changes in the leadership team since then, um, but they have definitely got the right people on the right on the right, on the right path now. Great, Jabra. Um, so mine was, I actually got feedback from a client that said they got more clarity in one day with me than they had in 17 years of business. And to me, that was just like, that. that's what we do it for, right? Because when you have those light bulb moments, it's just great. Um, and I mean, I'm very fortunate. I've got a lot of feedback from clients about the things that they actually achieve. But that to me was just the, the one that nailed it for me. Nice. Mm. Yeah, for me, I have a, uh, a client who's um, one of their sort of operations or um, client services manager uh, was really quite um, uh, sort of non-commercial, you know, very much in that, you know, I don't think we need this. It's a great place to work. We all love the owner. You know, we're doing okay. Do we need something like this? And um, in the next session, I think she rated our first day together maybe a seven or eight out of ten. Mm. It was kind of like, yeah, you know, it's mm. sort of in that seven, It's which is kind of okay. And in our next session, um, she oh, maybe ten minutes into the session, she said, oh, Jenny, Jenny, um, can I rate the day now? It's a ten <laughs> because you know how much I think we needed this. Which has become an ongoing joke. Of she's always like, I was the number one fan. I thought that we absolutely needed to do this, uh, which is just this ongoing uh, sort of in joke. And her uh, one of her expectations for the day was that she would learn something. And within the first ten minutes, she had learned something. So she was uh, by you know we'd started at nine, and by nine fifteen, she'd rated at a ten. And um, and it's really nice to have sort of been part of that turnaround. And it is a great business. They're doing 
really um, great things and uh, made a few, as you said, Nick, made a few changes on the leadership team that have been uh, for, you know, absolutely what the business needed. But uh, she's now one of my biggest sort of fans and always referring people to me. And, um, you know, but but that um, ongoing joke of, you know, I, w- I was the one who thought we needed this. I was all in has just become sort of our, our, our private joke, if you like. Excellent. And you brought up a really valid point there. I think the fact that every single meeting we run in EOS is actually rated is really, um, it was a bit of an eye opener for me because, you know, I I've worked in council for 18 months of my sins and we'd have meetings for meetings for meetings for meetings <laughs> sake and, and nothing you know, nothing ever got done. And we all just kind of had nice little cut sandwiches and little mint, little mince pies. It was all beautiful. Um, but the fact that we rate every single meeting, including the weekly meetings, the quarterly meetings, all of those, it's all about actually recognizing what's working, what's not working. And, and looking to improve each time. So even when you get your sevens, it's like, well, what can we do better? And I really enjoy that, um, not only for my clients' meetings, but when we actually meet with our clients, the fact they rate how we work together on that day is is great feedback for us all the time. Absolutely, yeah. Mm-hmm. Nick, any questions? Yeah, I've got a couple. One, one that comes up a lot, and it's kind of at the start of the journey, is who should come to the focus day, which is our first major day in Traditionally, it's about building the leadership team, but you know, the, the challenge is you don't want to have too many people there, but you also don't want to leave people out that can contribute. So that's the kind of questions I've had. So I'd be interested to hear how you guys have handled that question. So I'm going to be really honest. In the beginning, not so well. <laughs> so one, my first two focus days, I actually had 10 and oh, 11 wow. people in the room wow. because um, there were some, well, one was there was a whole bunch of shareholders and the other one was they were actually all part of a senior leadership team in the existing company. And so I thought they actually had to be there because they're shareholders, they need to be involved in the, the setting of the strategy for the business, et cetera. And with the second one, it's like, well, we've got 11 people who think they're on the leadership team, so we probably should work out whether they should or shouldn't be. My, my recommendation now is to say, hey, look, this is going to be really, really confronting. I would much rather that you think about the people you expect to be on the leadership team, usually four to eight at most in the leadership team that could be in that room. If there's anybody you think might not be, I'd much rather not have them come to that session. Um, and maybe somebody you didn't come to that session come into the leadership team later um, than have them in there sort of disrupting the day and, and, and feeling bad about what's going on. So, you know, redefine what leadership team team actually means. It's not senior management team. This is not the senior leadership team from a title perspective, but it's who are the people who will absolutely need to be involved in taking this business forward or that lead the main functions of the business and, and just bring those people in. Mm-hmm. Learned my lesson. <laughs> that, yeah, had some big fights in those focus day <laughs> sessions, which I do not want to repeat. <laughs> yeah, t- touch wood, I haven't had any big fights yeah. on my focus day. I had some interesting ones, but... Oh. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I just, yeah. There's not much I haven't seen in a focus. I'm not, I've literally we've had people, and and I, and I say this, sharing this, just because I think people need to understand it is a bit confronting. I have we have had tears. We've had one person who completely refused to engage at all. Um, we've had people who've got almost into sort of fisty cuff fights and things. And um, and as you said, it, that's the first part of the day, and then by the end of the day, it's all turned around. Every kind of is on the same page, understand what's happening. But I think it's important to note that you know we, we it's almost like you have to break a few eggs to make an omelet, and so the focus. Focus day is really about breaking those eggs. Absolutely. Yeah, and I I very much along the lines of what you said, Deborah, I haven't had – I've had those conversations where should we bring everybody? Uh, No. (laughs) Um, You either um, don't invite them if you think that they're not going to be on the leadership team or if you do and they're not, then you're going to be the one to have that conversation to say – you're not on the leadership team, often that will sort of stop people from putting out the, you know, open invitation, everybody come in. Um, <laughs> so it's, I always sort of um, do the less is more, um, you know, the, the uh, ideal number of that four to eight, um, closer to four is better mm-hmm. and really the people that you think will end up being part of that sort of key leadership team um, are the ones that need to be there because you know other people can be brought up to speed if you have a new member of the team um, join we can bring them up to speed um, far more efficiently than having a big room of people who are um, you know really just don't need to be there in the first place yeah, cool yeah. Cool. Uh, my next question would be um, who who should be or what role should be the integrator? And is that a dedicated role or is that a 
Is that a, <sighs> a, an existing person on the team? That's, that's a question that comes up a lot, generally prior to the yeah. session, but yeah, I had that question quite a few times. Interested to see how you handled that one. This is actually a really interesting one for me because people often say, oh, you know, EOS is just a framework and it's a cookie cutter. It's the same for everybody. And yet in my experience of all the clients I've worked with, it so is not. <laughs> so even though the framework is the same, there was just so many different variations within those organizations. And so I've got some companies who have, you know, chosen to bring in an outside integrator. Um, and often it's not necessarily a full-time role. So we have this kind of vision of a GM or a COO being a full-time role and so therefore the integrator must be a full-time role. But I had one company where they had 140 staff based around New Zealand and they had a part-time integrator who literally did one day a week managing the leadership team and the special projects. And so it wasn't a full-time role. It doesn't have to be. I had another company who actually employed somebody externally um, to come in and do the integrator and the operations um, role because the, the two combined kind of made up a full-time role and it sort of made sense to do that. And then I've got other companies who actually just employ external fractional integrators, uh, which is somebody who just comes in for a portion, one or two days to actually do it. So I've had everything from people being, you know, elevated up into that role once they prove their GWC it to people existing, kind of wearing two hats to having fractional integrators. Cool. And Jen, what about you? Yeah, I um, I sat in the integrator role in our business effectively for about 10 years um, you know, prior to EOS. And then uh, probably the first two years we were running under EOS, I sat in that role. And for me, I don't think it was ever a, a full-time role as integrator, but I um, sort of took on the, um, the sort of the admin side of the business as well. Uh, not so much finance. We had a, a, a fractional CFO. Um, and... My clients now, um, they're probably sort of sitting in that the integrator, um, one client is visionary integrator um, and the other's more sort of integrator and operations. Um, so not full-time roles. It, um, you know, to me, you need to be a decent-sized business to have a full-time dedicated integrator. Um, most of them sort of have a secondary role as well. Yeah, and that's what I've experienced on. Um... The, typically, if the company still exists of the originating founders, um, one of those ends up kind of in the visionary seat and one kind of ends up in the integrated seat because that's how business starts. You've got to have someone with the ideas and then someone who can execute. It makes perfect sense. Execute. Um, yep, but yeah. as the leadership yeah. teams grow and move, it, it, can be a, it can be a sales manager who has the integrator seat as well. It can be – don't typically see finance managers having – the integrated seat, to be honest, are more operational or, um, mm. you know, project-based, you know, COO-type roles. Um, yeah, but it's just an interesting question that, that does pop up. And and we kind of yeah. – the thing I love about the EOS process is the team decides themselves in that, that session about the accountability chart. Uh, and if no one jumps out as the obvious choice, then that's when it becomes a vacancy and we go and recruit. We either get a fractional integrator to come yeah. in or someone to come and teach someone to bring them up to speed. So, yeah, I, I totally agree with what you guys are saying. Yeah, cool. And I, I think there's something I'd like to add to that as well. I think people see this integrator role as being sort of, you know, get a little bit of an ego thing, like, oh, look, I'm, I'm running the whole company. But they've got to understand it's also one of the most challenging roles because they've got to have the tough conversations with all of the leadership team. They've got to keep that visionary um, in the visionary <laughs> box and make sure they're not, you know, messing around, middling in the day-to-day -day business operations. They've got to have the tough conversations with the visionary as well and sometimes challenge them for these ideas that the visionary is absolutely hooked on and thinks is the best thing since sliced bread. Fred, nobody mentioned robots here, um, and, <laughs> and actually have the conversation to kind of go, you know, is this really a good idea and be quite sort of staunch and quite firm with that while not cutting things off and not, um, you know, not sort of uh, subduing the, the enthusiasm of that team. So it's not actually an easy job, I don't think, and keeping meetings running on time and that sort of stuff, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty challenging job. I've had one of my clients, over, yeah. we've been working together for 12 months and I think we're on the third person in the integrator seat. Um, and yep. yeah, initially a couple of goes was out of obligation. Oh, I've been here for a long time. I I can see that if I don't be the integrator, I won't have a seat on the leadership team. So kind of mm. put the hand, they put their hand up and we all said, oh, okay, yeah, there was no other better option. Um, but it, <laughs> but you have to trust the system. It, it pans out. 
And over the next you know, two quarters, that person rang me as the influence and I can't do this anymore. I'm not the right person for the job. So when we do our next quarterly, let's put that as an issue we need to, we need to resolve as a leadership team. Um, that, that's perfectly fine. It's quite common to happen as well. Yeah, cool. I think the integrator, it's more about the, um, you know, the, the capacity or, or the sort of natural tendencies of the person in that seat. Um, you know, it needs to be somebody who's quite organised, who is willing to have those conversations, um, you know, difficult conversations, um, somebody who can sort of multitask, take on different projects and keep everybody, um, you know, on, on track. Um, and traditionally, a, a true visionary doesn't perform in that role because none of those things come easily uh, to a visionary. So it can actually be more detrimental. Um, I I was, as uh, I mentioned earlier, I, I was integrator in our business for a long time. And when we started the EOS process, I put my hand up for the role of integrator and said, you know, yes, I get it. Yes, I want it. Yes, I had the capacity. And one of our team called me out and said, bullshit. You don't want that role. And I had to admit that he was right. Um, probably a little bit of sort of fear of, you know, well, you know, um, if I don't do this, what do I do? Um, mm -hmm. A bit of obligation. Um, and, you know, that, I, you know, everybody will expect me to do that. Um, so that person actually stepped into that role in that meeting. But it became really clear very quickly that he just wasn't quite there yet. He just didn't have some of the skills. So I actually stepped back into that role with a plan, um, I think a one-year plan to upskill him and fill those gaps um, until and then hand that role back over to him. And he, you know, the the Monday, uh, no, next Monday w was the day that he was stepping into that role. And on the Friday, he came to me and he was in an absolute state. He could barely string words together to form a sentence and finally figured out that he was having a bit of a panic attack because Monday was the day that he was stepping into that role. And he was just like, oh, my God, you know, what have I signed up for here? So we pulled out the checklist and we went through and said, you know, have, have we done this? Yes, we have. Have we done this? Yes. So we went through the list. All of it was yeses. And he said, oh, okay, good-o. Uh, well, I'll see you Monday then. And off he <laughs> went. So sort of um, it just, again, that EOS, that that process, that checklist, the plan just allowed for that transition. You know, I finished up on the Friday um, as integrator and he came in on Monday as the integrator and it was all handed over and it just, just worked. Right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, but for me, uh, stepping into the role as integrator, um, for me, it was absolutely obligation. I felt yeah. like that was the role that I was meant to be in. Um, but, it, you know, whether it was fear, whether it was ego, I don't know. Um, but it um, it worked itself out. Yeah. yeah. I just one of the things I actually love about that whole accountability chart building as well, because it's the, it's the only... Um, methodology that I have seen where we design the structure and then we actually ask people what role they want and you know that because they've always been in xyz role that's like well that's the role I've always been in we're going no no which one do you really really want and they get to put their hands up and sometimes it doesn't work out they're not the best person for the role they don't generally see it but you've now got an understanding of where people's um, you know where their passions lie where they want to go and it means you can actually do that whole development plan like you just talked about where you can go okay so you're not quite ready to be an integrator yet or not quite ready to be the um, the, the sales um, division leader yet, but we can now work on that, knowing that's what you want to do. Let's find out what the gaps are, help you fill them, and then that can be your future career pathway. One of my early clients was three brothers in a business, and then another, and they were all leadership team, and another two on the leadership team. And in our first session, um, first or maybe the second session, one of them said, you know. I actually don't want to do this. I don't like leading people. I don't like having to come into the office and do all of these meetings. I just want to go and sell stuff. <laughs> so he went from sales manager leadership team and he was not performing, um, but he'd been in that role for, oh, from memory, seven or eight years and caused no end of frust frustration to himself and everybody else. Mm. So he left at the end of that day not on the leadership team and everybody was so much happier, including him. But nobody had ever actually asked him, um, 
did he want to do it, which was a no. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't think he'd even really asked himself. It was just sort of, you know, it had just kind of happened and evolved into him being in that role. Yeah. And everybody thrived. Yeah, good. You must have some stories too, Nick. No. Eh? Because I had a, I had the perfect integrator in our business. Oh, of course, <laughs> <laughs> silly me. Uh, one of the transition between from from Jenny to our other general manager was was one of the aha moments for us, and one of the the key things that we, we were on leave somewhere, and we we said to each other, "This has actually worked. We've now we have actually achieved our number one goal, which was to build a leadership team." employee-led company and where we can go on a holiday and not have to worry about the business because we've got all that stuff in place. We know the processes are happening. We know the little 10 meetings are happening. We've got a people accountable for different roles. Yeah. So that was a, that was a really good um, process to go through. And like, like Jenny said, it, it, it took a couple of goes to get it right, but we, we nailed it in the end. Um, that's probably the only other one I would add to that is um, one of our well, Nick, before you go on with that, we, we were in the situation prior to EOS of not being able to take more than a week of leave right. because we we're both uh, in that, working in that business. And that was Wednesday to Wednesday. So we were there Monday, Tuesday this week. We had a week off and then next week we were back Thursday, Friday. And we'd been doing that for years. And that holiday that Nick was talking about, we were away for five weeks. I think we got two phone calls. And when we came back to the office, everybody kind of went, oh, you're back. And I was like, well, you know, if you don't need us, oh, actually, they don't need us. This is fantastic. <laughs> so part of it was sort of like, oh, my God, they don't need us. But, uh, but yeah, all, uh, you know, um, it was what we wanted. We'd finally been able to achieve yeah, what exactly. we wanted. So one, one example of, of that kind of transition from roles to roles was I was the you know, visionary, plus I was also the sales manager you know, business development. Mm -hmm. And one of our sales team said that he wanted, wanted my job. Said, oh, interesting. Yeah, nice. So it just happened to be my son, one of my sons. And uh, he said, well, that's good to know. Thanks for your feedback. So we kind of did the, and then I think the next quarterly session brought it up again. What was his actual feedback? No, so, well, they initially wanted it. And then the next quarterly session, he said I was doing a shit job as a sales manager. <laughs> and we had an external sales coach at that time and she pretty much agreed. And then I think two other people in the meeting Ooh. said, yeah, yeah, you're right. So, so I, I, the GWC, I didn't, didn't want it, you know, and I didn't want it. I didn't want to be the sales manager anymore. I did it out of obligation mm. as a lot of people do. And, and, and that particular session, that second one, we had a, a, a new member of the sales team who'd been with the business less than a month it might was you know week three maybe and all of this is going on around him in this session we're running a, a sales team quarterly and uh you know our son said to nick you know you're a shit sales manager you're doing a shit job and there's sort of this uh you know, bit of sort of talk about you know our sales coach agreed and this new guy was literally sliding under the table i think he <laughs> he thinking oh this is going this is going to get very ugly <laughs> there's sort of this little <laughs> face peering up over the desk saying oh okay well nobody's there's no fisticuffs no, um everything's okay and um, he said to me afterwards that was pretty wild <laughs> but once again we, we all agreed that yes i didn't want it but at that particular time the other guy didn't have the capacity to do it. So we set a place in plan and within six months he got that role. And I stepped out of out of the sales manager role and just as an account manager, which is what I love doing, going out and seeing clients. So so yeah, it's a real powerful tool. Yeah. And I just that's a really interesting thing that the whole capacity to do it. So when we do this in the in the beginning, people think capacity means yeah. time capacity. Um, but it's a lot more than that, isn't it? What well, how would how do you describe capacity? To me, the, the capacity last? is you have the skills and knowledge to do the job in a reasonable time frame. So there's obviously going to be people that are faster and quicker and people that are slower, but yeah, you know, there's nothing external you need to be able to fulfill that role in the business. That means you have the capacity. Can you get better at it? 100% you can get better at it. Then you might have more capacity and you can take on some other things. Um, but yeah, you generally, you know, getting it means that when you wake up in the morning, ah, oh, man, I love doing this. This is what I know what the job is. I really get it and I want it. This is going to help me achieve my goals or what I want to get in life and where the company's going. And that capacity is, I know what, I know how to do the job. I've got all the technical skills and I've got the ability. 
yeah, I might struggle at some times to get it done faster than the other guy, but generally that's okay. And, and from my perspective, the, the capacity is the only thing we negotiate on. If you don't have a tick in, get it, and tick in, want it, there's no, no chance you can have that job. It just will not work for the company. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, agree. And I, I, I guess I start with the get it. And to me, get it is you were born with a natural affinity for this role. So if it's finance, you have a natural affinity for numbers. You you just, you know, you wake up in the morning excited about going and do, doing numbery stuff. <laughs> yeah. um, and capacity is I guess that's all not of, your forte. <laughs> it's definitely well, it's not actually, my forte. Actually, um, numbery no, stuff. No, 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 no. Numbers is not my theory. thing. You need to watch the show called yep. uh, Eight Out of Ten Cats Does Countdown. Oh, right? I love that. And if you, if you, like me, I naturally get the numbers game. I get that numbers game right probably more often than I get it wrong. The word oh. one, I'm wow. completely useless at. So you can tell pretty quickly. There's some things you can do to tell, well, are you naturally affinity, affinity, <laughs> naturally aligned with numbers or with letters? Um, so I'm definitely a numbers yeah. guy. We're Letters is mine. Yeah. Letters is mine too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And and to me, so get it is natural affinity. You were born yeah. with, you know, that in your DNA. Mm-hmm. Uh, and capacity is everything that you've done since then. It's your education. It's your qualifications. It's your experience to mm-hmm. add to that natural affinity. That's, that's a good yeah. way to put it. No, I completely agree. And, I, and the same with Nick, um, what Nick said, you know, it is about that knowledge, skills, um, experience, but it is about being able to do it in a reasonable time frame. So it doesn't mean you have to be an absolute genius or you have to be an absolute expert at it. There's always room for improvement, but you have to be able to do it in a reasonable time frame. We would expect not spend, you know, 10 hours doing a very very basic um, invoice in accounting, for example. Yeah, and, and the main thing, the GWC for me, is that I, I don't want to see a team of people where a role's assigned to an individual who doesn't who doesn't really want it. They're doing it out of obligation. Oh, well, I've been a sales guy here for the last 10 years, so yeah, I should be the sales leader. Yeah, well, our great friend Jack Daly, I mean, he hit me between the eyes with a freak at that last session I went to. Because... And his big number one thing is a sales manager should never, ever have a sales target. And that was my failure because throughout my entire history as a sales manager, I always had the biggest sales target as well. So naturally, Mm. I'm going to do my deals and close those ones before I have time to help the other team members close their deals. And that's not what I'm, that's a, that's a manager, not a leader. Like if you want to lead a sales team, you need to not have a sales target at all and you're totally focused on helping the people in that team achieve their targets. And that, that was a real, um, yeah. Yeah. a really good consolidation of what I've learned in practical experience. But if you had told me that 10 years ago, I would have had a completely different result, I reckon. <laughs> yeah. And I loved what he said too about, you know, and don't take your best salesperson and make them the sales uh, manager, manager because you want them in the team yeah. selling stuff. <laughs> And it's funny, you know, when I think back through our journey, that's exactly what we did. And at the time, I kind of knew, like, why are we doing this? Um, but never kind of had took the time to think about why are we actually doing this? Because, uh, you know, it's just it's sort of a natural thing. You know, this person's really great at sales, so we'll make them the sales manager so they can lead the team. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. Yeah. So I've got another question that comes up a bit for me, and I'd love to get your insights on yep. this one. Um, and it's to do with um, the to-dos versus the issues and where the things sit when they're in between a rock and a to-do. And, you know, because uh, my experience with the clients and my experience myself, we end up with this massive long to-do list and then the issues list. There seems to be some, for some reason, some desire to close all the issues out every meeting and generate a big load of to-dos. And um, what I'm trying to find out is how how have you helped people understand that it's kind of the reverse of that in my theory, that the issues list should be the big list of all the problems. And then the to-do is what you've committed to do in the next seven days to solve those problems. So how have you guys found mm-hmm. that and what's what's worked to get them on the right track? 
Yeah, similar to what you were saying is that I actually think the issues list, it doesn't matter if your issues list is long, it should be. It's kind of a holding, it's like a parking lot for the things that are going on. And so you might take an issue and you might discuss it and you might solve it and that would become a to do, but it wouldn't, may not have solved the entire issue. It's just the first step in solving that issue. And so put that to do on the to do list and the issue kind of stays on the list because there's still a, a phase two or a phase three or whatever comes um, from it. Um, and people get nervous. Like, oh, we've got 72 issues on our to do, on, on, on our issue list that's okay um, and in fact you know it can be as long as we're actually taking the time to go through them and go what are the most important ones and we're discussing the most important ones um, and every once in a while cleaning up that list to go actually is, is this still relevant uh, it's a great holding place for all of that stuff that needs to be yeah. held somewhere no thanks I agree yeah. yeah I I do th- we we did the same thing in our business and I uh, um I guess, um, sort of teach the same thing with clients is leave it on the issues list. So if, some, if something's an issue and somebody's on leave, for example, just put a date on it mm-hmm. so that, you know, when that person's back from leave, it's the 1st of February, um, then we'll tackle that one. But don't uh, put it to do for somebody and date it in February when they're back or put it to do in them that then, you know, just sits there and becomes stale. Leave it on the issues list. Yeah. And it comes down to because, you know, we expect them to do 90% of those to-dos in the seven days. So the whole thing of less is more again, right? We, we You actually want to have the major issues. Sometimes it might be one or two or three that get, to, you know, solved in a meeting. And then that should lead to one or two or three to-dos. So you can come back next week and go, yes, nailed it. Um, yes. Yeah. And I, I had the same question about rocks. Sometimes we'll say, well, what happens if we finish all of our rocks? And it's like, Awesome. You can do some more work. It doesn't mean you have to stop. <laughs> <laughs> do more rocks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's the other thing with rocks is just because we set a due date of the next quarterly doesn't mean you can't finish it early. Like, in fact, it's because yeah. as soon as you, this is obviously one of the highest priority challenges for the business. We've all decided as a team. So getting it done quicker mm. is going to bring more benefit to the business. Don't wait till the last week. Um, don't do what we used to do in high school yep. when we had an exam or a an assignment due leave it all to the last weekend to get it all done no we want to do it right now start at the beginning yeah <laughs> to be fair that worked for me throughout university but probably not a great strategy <laughs> not in business, business, <laughs> in business not so much yeah. no because <laughs> <No. laughs> you're right the sooner you get it done the the, the sooner you actually uh, are rewarded with Benefit the benefits of doing yeah, it yeah yeah I, I love the the um the the description one of the other EOS implementers I heard give recently that, uh, you know, you have your uh, 12 weeks to or 13 weeks to get your rock done. So for the mm-hmm. first 10 weeks in each uh, leadership meeting or L10 meeting, you say, you know, it's on track, it's on track, on track. And then week 11, you say while crying, does anybody remember what this rock was? Because I haven't <laughs> actually started it yet. And now I can't remember what it was. Um, and by 12, week 12, you, you know, you're, you're off on stress leave. Um, and week 13, you're MIA. Um, <laughs> yeah, so on track is not, I haven't started it yet. And I can't remember what it was. Um, so making sure as integrator that you're actually really holding people accountable and, and getting those regular updates, where are you up to? And, uh, but also one thing we learned early on in our journey um, running our business on EOS is the wording around rocks is so critical and don't bite off more than you can chew. So yep. we would put things like um, research, implement a new tool for whatever and everybody using the new tool hmm. in 13 weeks. Yeah. Impossible. <laughs> So we learned because we'd researched it, we'd decided which one we were using and we'd started the implementation process. But we certainly hadn't finished the implementation and nobody was using it yet. So rock not done. Where if we'd researched, uh, made the rock as research and decide, Mm. um, you know, what tool we're going to use um, and perhaps, you know, implementation plan or something along those lines, you can achieve that. And if you, you know, do your research and pick something really quickly and roll it out in the quarter, that's even better. But make sure that you actually have those rocks worded in a way that is achievable in that three-month uh, time frame, um, because you still have your job to do. Yeah. 
Yeah. And that's the other thing. I mean, if you think about working on the business versus working in the business, you know, they, they say that you, it's the whole 80 20 rule again. You should be spending 20% of the time working on the business, which is the rocks, the important stuff. And the other stuff is sort of working in the business. So that's actually one day a week mm. that you should be working on those rocks. So that could be two half days, that could be a full day. Uh, but you actually need to put time aside because otherwise, when are you actually going to do these rocks? You know, they're just mm. going to get, um, you're going to get consumed with the day to day stuff and not actually get it done. I also think that um, it's important that you, um, in order to not lose sight of the rocks, it's, it's okay to ask in a level 10 meeting, I just want to try the thought, in a level 10 meeting, it's okay to kind of go, hey, Jenny, I know that you keep saying that that rock is on track, but I, I'm, I would like to get an update on that. And you drop that down to the issues list and it becomes one of the list, the issues on the issues list. And then you may get round to it if it's one of the most important things and you may not do, but it is okay. I'm not saying I don't trust you, but I'm saying I'd like to get an update just so we can have a bit of a, a sense as to how you're going with that. I think that's perfectly acceptable. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, I, I'm uh, actually working with one of Nick's uh, EOS clients at the moment um, in a, I guess, a fractional integrator sort of a, a role. And I was working with one of their leadership team yesterday um, mm-hmm. because she has um, a couple of rocks and um, she just wasn't sure, I guess, sort of how to start the ball rolling because they're um, things that f- fall into her team um, and she has accountability to get them done, but she's going to use team members to actually do them um, and, you know, I guess, do the, uh, the legwork. So we went through, um, you know, this is the rock, what does done look like? Mm-hmm. And then work back from, backwards from there. What are the major steps? Um, so then she can start allocating, um, uh, you know, create a project effectively out of that and use one of their other tools, um, you know, to have those project steps. So, um, and then she's got the major steps, um, you know, that she can tick off those milestones and, you know, just really sort of dig down and say, well, you know, how am I actually going to get this done? Mm. Um, and, you know, bite-sized chunks um, rather than looking at it saying, oh, you know, overwhelmed, uh, don't know where to start. I'm going to go and, you know, I don't know, get a massage. <laughs> <laughs> And I'll look at it tomorrow. Um, yeah. That's cool. Cool. Uh, yeah, so the only other kind of share I'd like to hear from everyone is the – I get a lot of questions about should we be preparing for the Level 10 meetings before we get to them or do we just rock up and do all the work in the meeting? Um, so that's kind of a, a question I get sometimes. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, just be interested to see if you've come across that one before and had any any advice or any suggestions on how to maximise or the effectiveness of these level ten meetings. So I'm, I'm, I don't know if this is EOS pure or not, but I actually think it is quite important to kind of prepare for those meetings. And I'll never forget, and I won't say what client it was, but I sat through a client level 10 meeting as we do to to help them on that journey. And this person who was in charge of finance, um, the first issue he wanted to deal with was the budgets for the year when we got to the issues. And he spent about 45 minutes walking us through this massive, great big, long um, spreadsheet. <laughs> and I just thought, wow, you know, we've just spent 45 minutes just even getting to the the you know the the to understand what this spreadsheet is what was the outcome you really needed from that and of course when we're observing we can't jump in we just sit back and we listen we see what goes on but I said to them you know imagine if you'd actually circulated that report beforehand as this is a report I'm going to present at the meeting and the outcome that I'm going to need from it is you know what you know your approval or any concerns that you might have from it and then you could actually raise that as an issue now that means you're preempting that issue will get discussed but one would assume it was pretty important if it's the financials for the year so it's pretty likely it will get discussed and I just think that sometimes by thinking about you know what can I possibly circulate beforehand or what can I have thought about beforehand so I'm not going in there just I mean winging it's great when we're really good at it but it's not necessarily the best result for the organization (laughs) and I take note of issues in the middle of the night when I wake up and so for me I've got my own personal issues list that um for the business that I will actually write down and bring into level 10 meetings when I come in as well And I, I use two things. One, I I guess I teach as part of uh, the implementation process, the leadership team meeting is your most expensive meeting. Hmm. The 90 minutes that you have your whole leadership team, if you work it out on an hourly rate for those people in there over 90 minutes a week for, you know, X amount of weeks per year, it's a really expensive meeting. 
Yes. So you need to make the best use of that time because you're making a big investment uh, in that in that 90 minutes. And the other thing, I actually, Nick, uh, use your insistence from our time uh, running on EOS in that um, when we came to the issues list, Nick flatly refused to discuss an issue that had a heading, some vague heading with no detail and, and in the software yeah, like tool. Yeah, sales managers to run it. <laughs> <laughs> or, but, you know, um, I don't know, you know, issue with X. It's like, what the hell does that mean? And there's no detail. There's no thought. Um, the person who's raised it, who's entered it in software, can't even remember what it was. Nick would just flatly refuse to uh, discuss it. Mm. So making sure that people – and also the other thing that we insisted on was you have to be able to articulate what the issue is in two sentences or less. Uh, so you had to actually – know what the issue was, have thought about it and mm -hmm. raise it in a way that um, it could be discussed at that leadership team um, and come up with a solution rather than some vague thought um, or nothing. You know, um, X, you know, X person on the um, leadership team hasn't raised an issue in months. So does that mean that your team is running absolutely 100% perfectly with no issues? Yeah, I don't think so. Um, so, again, integrator comes in and has a conversation with that person and says, what's going on here? Um, and because in our business, after a couple of years of running on EOS, we had everybody in the business ran a, a level 10. Uh, so our finance team, our service teams, um, you know, everybody in the business was involved in, a, in an L10 and some only a couple of people, so there might have been 30 minutes through to 90 minutes. And... We were using the, one of the software tools that would push issues um, from one meeting to another one. So the sales team had had a discussion about an issue, felt that they didn't know the solution or didn't have the authority to make a decision about something so they could push it to the leadership team. Mm -hmm. We could have a discussion at our meeting and then push that back to them with a solution, a, a way forward, and uh, you know, just making really good use of, of the the. Uh, methodology and the system and um, you know then everybody knew what was going on um, they had sort of that record documented record of yes we've got approval to go and mm. ahead and do this yeah and, and for me it's the way I've seen it be most effective is, is that people have updated their to-dos before the meeting um, they got all the issues that they want to discuss updated yep. scorecard. scorecards will be updated updated all their issues into the system and they bring their top three issues in their head already because when I sit in the integrated seat or I'm running one of those meetings, if no one's got any ideas, I just pick my own three. And what in a healthy team, what you'll get is people will be competing to get their issue dealt with. And, and that's what I want to see. I want to see people competing to get their issues dealt with because they know, you know, we've got a level 10, whether it's a leadership one or it's a, it's a departmental meeting, you've got the people in that meeting that can make a decision. And if that issue is holding you back yeah. from achieving your rock or, a client issue or a staff issue, you need to fight to get it done. So my only advice for anyone out there is just come to those meetings prepared, make sure your to-dos are up to date, your issues are in the system, and you know which issues you want to put on the table first and don't don't hold back. Like I would be very quick at saying, all right, number, number X, X, Y, yeah, I want these three things dealt with first. You know? Anyway, that's good. That's cool. Cool. As, as you can see, um, between the three of us, we have years of experience and lots of examples of working with clients that we can share. And we're very passionate about doing this because, you know, um, we want to help people actually lead a better life through creating a better business. Um, so I'm really thrilled to have had the time um, to share some of these things with you. Um, thank you, Jenny and Nick, for joining us. Can't wait to see you hosting some of these podcast episodes in the future. Um, and, yeah, we'll look forward to running more sessions yeah, like thanks this. Thanks a lot, Deb. Uh, very excited to, to be here. Thank you. And uh, absolutely looking forward to um, to bringing you some other guests through and, uh, and being part yeah. of it. Thanks, Deborah. It's been great and a good start to 2023. So thank you for joining us today on Better Business, Better Life. Uh, we have really enjoyed answering these questions for you around EOS and what EOS is. We're now going to do another another series uh, where we get Jenny, Nick and myself back all together in the room. And we're actually going to answer questions around the recession. Um, what do we see coming in 2023? Will there be a recession? If there is, how do you prepare for it? Um, and particularly lots of tips and tools around how we've seen businesses not only get through a recession, but come out on the other side thriving.
So that will be our next um, series. If you've got any questions you'd like to have answered, just um, drop us a line. There's plenty of ways to get in contact with us. Um, get us the questions to us and we'll make sure we answer them in the next, the next session. Thank you.